the, the agenda um, will we'll, um, cover, first of all, um, uh, apologies to Judith Rigg, the secretary, will we'll, we'll take. Um, we'll go through the formal part of the, the AGM, and that will be followed then by a presentation by, by Jonathan Dent, um, talking about the urban rivers restoration work. And then uh, Tom um, will provide us with an overview of the year and the year ahead. Um, we will um, be using Zoom's polling function because as normal with AGM, there are a number of decisions where we, we need a show of hands. Um, and as Tom was saying earlier, um, with a number of people on screen, it's rather difficult to try and capture who's raising their hand. Zoom does have a polling function and, and Tom will, uh, will talk us through that when we get to the appropriate points and you'll be able to choose on screen, yes or no. Um, we'll need a, a proposer and seconder um, to raise a hand. Um, and again, we'll, we'll capture that information. We'll be um, approving the minutes of the last AGM over the 14th of September of last year. We're going to receive and approve the annual report and accounts and, and Stuart uh, Leslie, our treasurer, will provide us with uh, an update on that. And then the usual, uh, the reappointment of members of the Board of Trustees. Um, our constitution requires that a third of the trustees step down at the AGM. So we have the process of, of, of re-election um, and ratification of um, and I see Nick and Rosamond, um, sorry, Nick and Sarah, um, who are new trustees who have joined us during this, this last year. So let's move on then. Um, first item, um, any apologies received at all, Judith? Judith is waving a finger of one. Can you unmute just to tell us who, who that was? Bottom left. Yeah, I've got that. Uh, it's Kate Pickett from the university. Right, and I think we've also Jane Thurlow, one of the trustees, um, gave her apologies as well. Okay. So I think we, we, we have um, we have two. Yeah. Okay, so if no other apologies to be received, let's move on then to the minutes of the last AGM. Tom, can I hand it over to you then? I think you're just going to put those up just to remind us. Everybody should have had access to those already. But uh, just as a reminder. Well, yeah, they're, we, they're, they're visible, them. Tom. Yes. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I ask um, for approval of the minutes um, by participating in the poll? Tom, if you're able to present us with the poll. Thank you very much indeed. So, if you are happy having previously read the minutes and um, happy to accept them, if you can tick yes, if you have any concerns, um, then please tick no. And having done that, you'll see the submit button at the bottom of the, uh, the pop-up window there. Let's see if we've got a uh, second or two to complete. We're getting those to a couple more people. Okay. Yes, so we thank you very much indeed, Tom. So thank you all very much indeed for uh, 
accepting the minutes of last year. That's excellent, thank you. Um, and we need a proposer and seconder. And this is a show of hands from, from those whom we can see, or if your camera is switched off, if you want to open your microphone and, uh, and propose or second. So can I, can I have a, a show of hands? Adrian, um, thank you for proposing. Um, and would somebody um, second, please? Thank you, Rich, very much indeed. Thank you. Um, the as we're obviously dealing with the remotely, then the um, minutes will be signed PP um, to uh, to record your 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 voting there. <clears throat> right, and to move on then to um, receiving and improving the annual report and accounts. And, and this stage, um, can I hand over to Stuart to present the accounts and, and take us take any questions um, if anybody wants to to raise any points. As Tom was saying earlier, it's probably easier if you have a question to use the chat function. Um, just type your comments there and, and we'll be able to capture those. Right, so Tom and Stuart, I'm gonna leave you to, to do the double act. Stuart, you just need to come off mute. Apologies, I, I thought I was. Uh, I thought I needed to be taken off mute rather than I was. Uh, doing oh no, 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 no! This you have to earn your money around here and do it yourself. Oh, okay. I'm afraid none of this auto <laughs> business. Uh, okay, so look, I suppose just just really a few things um, to call out in the accounts. I'm not going to go through kind of line by line, but just to say that a, a, a good year um, in 1920 um, with um, a modest positive movement um, in funds. Um, but I suppose the, the key things that I really want to focus on just for the next couple of minutes is just to, um, one thing that comes out in the report uh, on page 25 is we, we look at the split of um, how the revenue how our revenue has been generated um, in 1920. Um, it's really positive to see the diversification of income streams um, where, where we are increasing our income from charitable activities and increasing our income from other trading activities. And becoming less reliant on donations and legacies um, and that's that's a really positive thing for the ultimately for the long-term sustainability um, of some nicks from a financial perspective um so the other thing to to highlight is is clearly revenue is is down on prior year but also expenditure is down as well um and that really is, is due to project related activity and, and actually that's that's a theme through 2020 21 so far as well in that where, where there has been a drop off in revenue that has been in relation to projects where we we have not undertaken that project activity because we have we have, have ultimately the project comes after the, the funding so to speak so so it's not a it's, it's not a risk as such um, on that perspective to be down on on those sorts of revenues and I suppose it, it's, it's that that different elements of revenues and I'll come on to that in a second around and that versus um, also on our costs as well what is core versus what is uh, discretionary um, so again I suppose looking at where, where our core funding is right now um, we're in a really strong place um, the core funding is well provided for in the short term um, and that's due to some great work from Tom and the team around getting some some grant monies in. And perhaps Tom, do you want to just just give a, a minute or two on the um, on the latest um, successful um, grant that we've had um, news of recently? Yeah, sure. So um, as everybody will uh, be aware, the the pandemic's kind of hit charities particularly hard, um, and we would be no exception to that. Um, you will have seen in the materials that came out that we've, you know, we've had to take advantage of the job retention scheme and we've done a restructure of core to try and make that kind of process a bit more uh, lean, a bit more efficient. Um, what part of that enabled us to do is to apply to the National Lottery Community Fund to their community, gosh, got to get this right, the community coronavirus community support fund uh, which is basically a kind of the emergency response if you like to, to covid 
Um, and we were very lucky there in being able to secure uh, the the six months of our remaining core costs. Uh, so we are now covered in terms of our general core overheads uh, up to the end of March of next year, which seizes out this, this financial year. It also gave a bit more money to ecotherapy, which is quite nice. So it's meant that ecotherapy is able to not only do the online provision that it's been doing through the emergency response, but also start bringing um, some kind of COVID uh, socially distanced uh, groups back as well. But that um, that grant in particular has uh, has really kind of helped secure the organisation. There have been other ones as well from uh, places like Two Ridings Community Foundation, from the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, but that, that one in particular has been um, a very big, uh, very big deal for us. So I, I suppose just, just to summarise that, it's, it's a fortunate position that we find ourselves in for the next six months um, and certainly a position that is more favourable than, than some other charities that, that are out there right now, but it is, is nevertheless still a position where we've got to have a lot of focus on what's coming over the next, over the medium term. Um, we've realised that there will be an adverse impact of, on future grant availability. Um, and we've also got the end of the government scheme to contend with. So we've been operating with a much leaner um, core cost provision over the last few months, whilst we've had activity, we're at a reduced level of activity. Um, and as we start to build the activity back up again, clearly associated with that will be additional cost. The positive side of that is a lot of that cost is actually just unlocking restricted funds for projects that, that we are already committed to and would like to get to get moving again. So um, I think in, in the short term, the financial position is good, um, but we do we do still need to have a focus on the on the longer term future. Um, and just just to that end, I suppose just to, uh, to finish off with a, a little bit on 2020-21 so far. Um, I'm pleased to report that so far we're looking at a, a modest surplus year to date for 2020-21. Now that will unwind a little bit over the rest of the year, but we expect to be broadly break even by year end for this year. Um, and then on the cash side, we've got a healthy cash position, um, which is trending above our historical average. And that some of that comes down to a lot of the saving that, that we've been able to, to manage through the pandemic period. Um, and again, not having those, those that core cost outlay, but having um, on the restricted fund side, um, re retaining those funds for a longer period for projects that we, we are still going to see through to completion, um, but we haven't been able to act upon um, in the short term. So I mean, look, that, that's just a, a very short summary. I'm very happy to take questions if anyone wants to go into more detail on any of that, but I, I, I thought they were some of the key themes just to draw out um, on the call tonight. Okay, Stuart, sure. thank you. Um, Ian Trainer has raised a question um, I don't know if you've seen, how much has the City of York funding been reduced? Has there been any reduction on rates for the Environment Centre? Do you want me to take that one, Stuart? Yeah, you can yeah. take that one, Tom. Okay. Uh, so in terms of uh, City of York Council uh, funding, that's essentially through uh, the contract for the waste minimisation service that we run for the recycling. So there's been no reduction in that because that's a that's a, a you know, a key working, a key requirement statutory service. Um, and the other piece is through a service level agreement that we have for the nature reserve. And we've been very lucky that that has also not seen any reduction uh, in it because it, it's a three year agreement. Uh, and the last conversation that I had with the council was actually looking at an increase in that service level agreement. Um, not a huge increase, <laughs> I, I hasten to add, but a small a modest increase in that because of all the work that we're doing uh, outside of the nature reserve as well. And I think it's been recognised that actually the value of what we can bring to green space in the city uh, is so much bigger than, you know, than just what can happen on the, on the reserve. So, so no, so there, there hasn't been any reduction uh, in those in those funded streams. Uh, in terms of reduction of the rates and the Environment Centre, we already receive rate relief because we're a charity. Um, there hasn't been any other kind of um, reduction to that rate relief. I believe that the rate reliefs were mostly, uh, the additional ones were related to hospitality organisations, I believe. Um, so yeah, we, we've, we've maintained that kind of charitable rate relief, but nothing further. Thank you. 
Has anybody any other questions at all before I ask for um, approval of the accounts? No, okay, all right. So Tom, if I could ask you to put up the poll then please to ask us to approve the independently examined accounts. Would I select yes or no, please? Almost there, just another couple of uh, couple of clicks and we'll be done. Can I just say that I'm probably not meant to be voting, but I'm a bit concerned about messing up the technology, so I have. <laughs> <laughs> so just saying that. <laughs> The, the voting is, uh, sorry, perhaps should have mentioned this at the beginning, so the, the polling votes um, are for paid up members. Yeah. So as long as you are a paid up member of St. Nick's, then you are able to vote. If you are not, then, sorry, please refrain from voting. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting point to me, is you really want yes, no, or I'm not eligible. Perhaps that's one that Zoom yes, hasn't I probably should of. have done that. I didn't think about that one. My apologies. Hopefully, hopefully we won't be having next year's AGM by this means. Let's all pray for that. <laughs> Indeed, many of these. Right, thank you all for uh, accepting that. Thank you very much indeed. So the last formal part, so then, or sorry, penultimate part, um, is the reappointment of members of the Board of Trustees. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, uh, our constitution requires a third of the trustees to stand down at the AGM. Um, and we do it on the basis of the longest serving members since the last AGM or anybody else who wishes to step down for that matter. Um, can I just ask for those trustees, um, because we have got some new faces um, that um, have got cameras on, can you just wave so everybody else knows who a trustee is? Thank you, Sarah, Judith, thank you, Nick, thank you, thank you, thank you. Stuart, right. Adrian, thank you. Rosman, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the three trustees who by rotation are due to stand down um, at this uh, AGM is Judith, Judith Rigg, Jane Thurlow, um, who um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, sent her apologies, and myself. On this now sharing, thank you. Um, those are our short uh, bios um, for your information. And we also um, need to ratify uh, Nick and Sarah's um, appointments as trustees as they were co opted onto the board in November of last year. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. So I'd like to ask Tom to put up two polls. The first one um, is the reappointment of Judith, Jane and myself. Um, just a question, a housekeeping question here, Tom, so as not to, um, am I allowed to vote for myself? Probably not. I, I actually, I'm not I think sure. It's <laughs> nepotism is now, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll decline. <laughs> so, um, Judith and I will, will, will vote accordingly, but we'll ask everybody else to, uh, to vote. Um, please, thank you very much. Brand, thank you very much indeed. And then the second poll is uh, to ratify the um, appointment of Nick and Sarah to the board. I assume we can't ratify ourselves. Then you're letting me press one or the other. Yes, this is a um, take your pick um, time. <laughs> oh, this, Nick and Sarah, this is going to be tricky, isn't it? Now we know, <laughs> now we know who's going <laughs> to... Sorry, that, that's, that's my fault. Uh, this is my uh, first foray into um, 
whole creation uh, and I have obviously not quite um, done it right. So my, my apologies, Nick and Sarah, that was obviously not intentional. I thought I'd set it up in the same way as the previous one, but perhaps not. Maybe if the combined um, acceptance of both equals 100%. Because I don't think you can present it the second time and we could then choose the, the alternate. Can I suggest perhaps that people could put their votes in the chat and just say yes to both or yes to just one, maybe? Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> what, what, what a simple solution. That's why Ivana's running the chat. Thank you, Ivana. <laughs> <Not me. laughs> I should say I have an able assistant, Richard, who has been posting links to the documents, which we should have thought of posting ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Apologies. Yes, no thanks. <laughs> Collaborative effort, that's what it's about. And it also avoids that awkward conversation between Sarah and Nick. <laughs> I haven't done a count there, but I, I my, my, my gut feeling is that um, everybody has voted. I'll make it 15 for both. Mm, that means probably... Yeah, that, that's yeah. about that's about the number of people who have been voting. So right, fine, okay. So um, I, I propose that we we have acceptance for both Nick and Sarah, and uh, that's grand. And formal welcome to to Nick and Sarah, both already very active as trustees. And thank you for your input. Um, should anybody else um, be interested in in joining the board as a, a trustee, we we are always very welcome um, to to receive. Uh, expressions of interest. Um, probably the easiest way to, to, to start that process is to email secretary at stnicks.org.uk um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there with you. Right, um, moving on then, um, we're pretty well running to time, which is good. Um, next point is the appointment of independent examiners. Um, Outsource, who we've used in the past, have performed as our examiners for this year. They perform well, um, and we'd like to reappoint them as SNICs independent examiners for the, uh, the 2021 year. So, Tom, can I ask you to put up another poll then, please, to um, add a proposal that we reappoint Outsource as our examiners? And thank you all very much indeed. So that's um, full acceptance. Lovely. Thank you. So then the, the final point from the, the formal part of the meeting is really any other business. Um, if anybody has any points you want to raise, any, any, any questions, um, then um, perhaps either a show of hands or, or more simply using the chat function again, um, if there are any points you, you want to raise. Um, I'll just give... Annalise, thank you for that question. Who is now doing the work that David, uh, our finance officer, uh, undertook? Um, David did uh, uh, leave us as part of our core uh, team restructuring. Um, Tom, do you want to? I can answer that, but you, you'll give a more rounded and more, more detailed response. Sure. So um, the, it, David's role has kind of been split, really. Uh, so your consortium are doing our bookkeeping and the kind of day-to-day -day management 
accounts. So your consortium are a kind of a social, uh, a social inclusion organization. They do funding and all sorts of things based over in Nesborough. Um, we've had funding through them before. Uh, they know us very well through our Action Towards Inclusion project, and it's something that they are starting to starting to offer. Uh, so it's basically like a, a virtual uh, a virtual finance officer, essentially. Um, we have outsourced our payroll uh, to a company called Pay Plus, um, and that's so far working okay. I think the staff will perhaps um, nod and say that they've been paid, so <laughs> it's, it's fulfilling its function adequately. Um, and the other kind of um, admin aspect of David's role has uh, been sort of split between the two new roles uh, that Ivana uh, is now undertaking as sustainability officer. So part of that role is to uh, to kind of look after the centre essentially, because that's kind of our, one of our biggest sort of zero carbon um, sustainable aspects of what we do. Um, and the other role is through Esther, who's also here on the call with us. And Esther is our charity support manager so there are kind of admin functions that david was doing that uh, esther is now doing so that that role has been basically dispersed through uh, through a number of internal and external people and so far um so far so good sorry folks i've got to go, i've got to leave fairly soon uh, i know it's not part of the core um business but i just want to have a word say a word about the wild watch team um I've been involved in Wild Watch since May 2011, uh, only preceded by Kay. And um, Kay and I and another stalwart, Cliff, have not been able to attend recently. I just want to say how brilliantly the younger people who've stepped up to the mark and uh, put in some brilliant reports, um, particularly about invertebrates and finding new species for next and next, new speeches for the vice county uh, and i've just been doing an absolute brilliant job so i just want to congratulate them on that thank you ian for that um <clears throat> I, here. yeah no, it's thank you um for me i was astounded when um i it was just a figure that just happened to slip in in the uh, the annual report a thousand and forty one different species of flora and fauna now yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's it's incredible. a small reserve. Um, so thank you to everybody who's involved in Wild Watch. Um, it, it's, it, it's tremendous. Well, I've got to go now, folks, but it's been a lovely meeting. I don't, as Ivana knows, and Tom knows, I don't normally do meetings. But to have a meeting where I can drink a glass of wine and smoke my pipe is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say bye for now. <laughs> Take care. Thank everyone. you. Very much indeed. All the best to you. Bye, Ian. Hi. I've I've just noticed another another question pop up about yes. David's functions and what sort of amount and percentage has has the outsourcing saved. Uh, so this this financial year, the outsourcing and restructure won't really have saved very much at all due to redundancy costs and the fact that we're doing it halfway through the year and uh, all that kind of all that kind of stuff and setup costs of the new accounting system and things but once we get into next year the savings on core uh, expenditure is 22,000 pounds yeah hence the eyebrows good eyebrows there on the lease yeah definitely so it's it's fair it's, it's pretty substantial so our, our core costs tend to be around the kind of mid mid high 90s kind of ninety five thousand pounds a year so taking taking 20 22 off that is not an insignificant saving so hence it was not the most pleasant thing i've ever had to do in my um tenure at st nick's um and the whole the whole experience wasn't um wasn't you know it wasn't great to have to kind of you know have to do that and especially when redundancies and things are, are in place but hopefully the structure that we now have in place um, and the people that we have in place you know it's it's, it's really kind of um, it's using people's strengths you know with Ivana's all of Ivana's experience and you know and, and knowledge it's uh, you know the sustainability officer is a great role for her and the same with same with Esther in the charity support role and uh, we've just uh, we've just managed to recruit an engagement officer as well so that uh, uh, she'll be joining us on the 19th of October 
Okay, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Any further questions from anybody at all? If not, um, I'd like to formally close the, the business of the AGM and then we, we can move on to hear Jonathan talk about the Urban Rivers restoration. So everybody is happy. Let's, um, let's close the AGM then at 19.02. Um, if you want to record that, please. Esther, thank you very much indeed. Right, so two presentations uh, to come now. First of all, uh, as I said, uh, Jonathan Dent is going to talk to us about urban rivers restoration, the work that uh, he has been leading in that area. And um, I, think he's, I think Jonathan's uh, scheduled about uh, 15 minutes or so, and then I'm sure we've got plenty of questions to, to, to fire at him. Um, and then Tom's going to pick up at around about half past and talk about the highlights of last financial year and a bit of a teaser as to where we're, where we're going for 2021. Right, we can see that. Thank you very much. Okay, is that me? We've got you. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit about um, York, Bex. Um, a little bit about restoration, but I guess at this stage it's um, doing the work to get towards the restoration works. Um, so a little bit about the becks, plus a bit about the wider foss as well. Um, and stick any questions in the chat, and I think Ivana will keep an eye on those and we'll answer them when we can. So um, the Becks, I guess a bit of a timeline for a bit of context. Um, the first kind of confirmed Waterville records, although there was a few kind of unconfirmed before, was in 2011, um, so a long time ago. And that kind of first um, kind of piqued our interest in, in the Becks and the rivers. And before that, you know, they weren't really managed. They were just there, to be honest. Um, thanks to our kind of wild watch, we had lots of records, lots of photos. Ian's gone now, but Ian had lots of kind of really nice, furry, cute waterfall photos. Um, and it became a key species for us to, to manage for and to try and conserve. Um, through that, we kind of had various bits of funding. Um, so we had a waterfall project in 2015, a uh, bit of habitat restaurant, well, habitat improvement works. Uh, then a few more kind of negative things, Boxing Day floods, which we all remember, of course, um, whether they drowned some of the water wells or not, who knows, um, but certainly brought a different spotlight onto the, the becks and the rivers in York. Um, and shortly after that, the following year, we recorded um, the first record of, of American mink on the site, which are um, water wells main predators and their female mink is the only thing that can get into their their burrows so that was quite a, a kind of key thing really um, after that we've had various bits of funding community work looking at the becks as a whole so the becks we're talking osbaldwick and tang hall beck um beck cleanups um Hewitt home which is a really nice uh former wetland meadow or still a wetland meadow um up tang hall beck um, which we've been looking to restore and doing work on that. Um, then going out a bit further onto the FOSS, doing kind of monitoring ecological survey work, including uh, rather excitingly uh, last year and the year before, finding uh, white clawed crayfish, so our native crayfish at the source of the FOSS. Um, we, we thought they were there, we were told they were there, but we've um, since recorded the kind of most downstream um, populations um, and more recently we've kind of been looking at landowner engagement as well which has taken us more into the the rural areas which has been something different um, that we're not quite used to kind of working with with farm owners and farm farmers and, and things like that um, and then a couple of kind of bigger works which I'm sure everybody's heard about which um, they're kind of early on the timeline but nothing's really happened yet but I'll, I'll mention a bit more about that maybe um, but Hull Road Park restoration project, um, for those who, who know Hull Road Park, it's a bit of a kind of, well, it's a series of ponds basically and, and offers very little wildlife value 
Um, it's also got weirs that, that kind of stop things moving about. Um, so there's planned projects working with the Environment Agency through their Environment Fund to restore that. And then St Nick's Daylighting Project, which I'd love to tell you more about, but um, again, lots of delays and things with that. So again, working with the Environment Agency to hopefully put a new channel through St Nick's Nature Reserve. Um, but I'm not going to focus on them too much because they may not happen, to be honest, but hopefully they will. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this just just the crayfish. I mean, they're not on the decks, but it was just quite amazing to actually see them. So I don't know if this video works. I don't think it's going to work. Very short video, um, but I think it, you know when we think about the becks and the foss, it's very easy to think about the urban areas. Um, but you get up to the source near, near Yearsley, and it's you know it's like it's never really been touched. There's, there's some amazing habitat, and obviously some really important species that are still hanging on. Um, so to talk about the becks, we need to talk about where all the water comes from. Um, so massive catchment that's all connected, uh, the Suno catchment, so we've got the Swale uh, right up in the Dales, the Ure, the Nid, and then the Ouse, and it's, it's the upper Ouse which um, has an effect on York really, um, the lower Ouse kind of comes in a bit further down, and then you'll see on the right the, the, the Foss catchment as well. Um, which is on here, but it's important to think about where all the kind of the, the pressures are coming from, I suppose, and you know, the rain we've just had, the river's up again. So any bit of rainfall in the, mo in, in the Dales, and it has a massive effect on York. Um, the Foss itself as a catchment is quite an isolated catchment. You can see Yearsley at the top, um, where we, we've kind of recorded the crayfish, very rural for the, for the top half. You've obviously got Strensel Common in the middle, um, triple SI, really important, highest, most northern kind of uh, moorland site. Um, and yeah, just really nice site and refuge for water bowls as well. And then it gets a bit more urban as you go down. Um, and more closer to home, we've got the, the Beck's catchment. So Tang Hall and Osbaldwick Beck. Um, quite big areas really, um, and Tang Hall, the source, of, well, multiple sources of Tang Hall, but uh, one of them actually comes out of Strensel Common, which is the kind of green bit at the top of the, uh, the map. Um, so that, you know, it's a huge area, the old Foss Beck and, and joining Becks, which then flow down. Um, and then I was Baldwick Beck below, for, you know, Wartill, Holtby, uh, which is actually really close to the River Derwent as well. So it's, you know, connecting habitats, things like that. Um, and then there's the very urban sections, which originally is kind of where we were we were concerned and where we were kind of focusing our time. Um, but, you know, rivers, anything that kind of flows like that, we need a kind of downstream approach. So we, we've needed to go and look at the urban, air, the rural areas as well. Um, but yeah, some of the habitats, a lot of kind of green spaces along there, a lot of public accessible land, very different to the rural areas. Um, which makes it quite quite a few opportunities, really. Um, obviously, St Nick's and everything at St Nick's is affected by whether it's Wolf Avenue, Hewith Home, Derwent Thorpe, Os Baldwick Village. Um, so trying to work in those urban areas to have a positive effect downstream. Um, and the good thing is we've got, you know, City of York Council owned land. We've got Joseph Roundtree owned land, um, Parish Council land. So opportunities to work with them before it gets kind of too complicated in the rural areas. Um, so why would we intervene in the first place? Um, so you've got our very cute water voles, um, which were seen very regularly on site and now not so. You know, combination maybe of the floods and uh, mink being recorded on site. Uh, our last record was uh, earlier this year, so they are still hanging on. 
Uh, we know there's populations at Osbaldwick village as well, but there's old populations at Heworth home, places like that, which we just aren't finding them anymore. Otters, a bit more of a success story. So lots of pictures of poo there um, and some anal jelly, which is always nice and some prints. Um, but distinguishing signs for otters, we never see them, but we, we find so many field signs now up and down the becks. They've, they're doing amazingly well. So we need to think about them. We need to make sure their habitat is not being destroyed or managed incorrectly. Um, and we need to think about invasive species and those who know sitniks will know all the Himalayan balsam that's on the becks, but that's gradually getting less and less each year. Um, very successfully kind of making an impact on that. Um, Japanese knotweed, less successfully so far, but hopefully I can get out this autumn and do some stem injecting of that. And then not our picture, but uh, uh, American mink, which um, obviously a big threat to the water bowls. Uh, other kind of more man-made um, uh, issues. So we've got the culvert, which which comes through, which again is a bit of a you know dead habitat, really. Things, not many things can move up and down it. There's no plant life. There's no light, um, and it straightens the water and makes it run really fast. So it, it really alters the kind of the flow and the energy of the river. Um, upstream, we've got lots of straightened areas, managed as ditches, just wanting to get the water down as quick as possible. We've got weirs in Hull Road Park, which you know stop things moving up and down. Um, and then we've kind of got lack of over management on a lot of those green space sites, which I mentioned uh, in the urban areas. Sites which used to be, you know, the signs of what they used to look like, um, but just through lack of management, have just lost a lot of their value. Uh, flooding. Some people may disagree with this. You know, is it something we need to intervene on? You know, the flooding on the um, the green spaces on the urban areas. You know, they're acting as a flood um, floodplain, which they should do, um, which is doing a really good job. But you know, the flooding upstream and the flooding on the foss and the sooner is having an effect, and it backs up and has an effect on us. So, you know, it does impact. Um, but can we work with floods rather than against them? Um, so what can we do? Um, so what we're looking at at the moment, um, mainly through some really good training we had through the River Restoration Centre, is thinking more kind of catchment wide. And if we are going to start restoring, how do we best go about doing that? And to do that, it's a simple plan, I won't read through it all. Uh, we need to split up the catchment, uh, whether that's the, the whole foss or the becks. And then we need to know about it and understand it. So through desktop work, surveying, whatever it might be, um, identifying pressures and impacts. And then once we've got all that information, only then should we start thinking about the restoration works really, um, which all of that should feed into prioritizing and kind of setting objectives. So we're still, you know, we haven't got to that stage yet, but that's what we're working towards. So how do we understand our, our becks and our river? Um, a few surveys that we've been doing, which we can do with volunteers, which is, which is really good. So citizen science style surveys. So freshwater invertebrates, uh, they tell us a lot about the health of the river, uh, what pollutants are going in. A lot of um, freshwater invertebrate species are pollutant, in, uh, pollutant tolerant. And um, so knowing what we find in the water can tell us about the health of the water. They can also tell us about the habitat and lots of other things as well. Um, so we've been working on an urban river fly method and there's the general river fly method as well, which looks at things like caddis flies, mare flies, which are pollutant intolerant, and then things like leeches, which are pollutant tolerant. And it gives you a nice kind of scoring system. Uh, riparian mammal surveys. So, we, you know, we we knew the water voles were there, but we need to do kind of surveying to make sure they are still there or where their populations are at the moment. Um, so our becks are very heavily silted, so we mainly use rafts for that, but we often get in the water as well and look for field signs. Again, it's mainly poo, um, looking for kind of the signs of the, the latrines, uh, nibbling around the banks, burrows, things like that. 
uh, river corridor survey, which is a bit more of a kind of complicated one, um, as this complicated map will prove. Um, but it's an example of our kind of mapping work we've been doing as well. But river corridor surveys are really interesting, really. So you're kind of getting in the water and trying to kind of understand the, the structure of the river and that kind of see it as a kind of cross section, the habitats on the side, uh, where there's trees kind of over the river, trees on the banks, what the plant life is in the water, marginal. Um, where it's running fast, where it's running slow, where it's pooling, all of those features which tell you a lot about the river, um, the beck, and actually what wildlife it will support, and really good for kind of monitoring change as well. Um, walkover surveys. Um, so this, this is one we did on the FOSS, but you know, generally looking at the river, and you can do this from the banks, and you know, what issues are there keeping an eye on? what's flowing in in the drains, are there any kind of disconnections from, from the drains, things like that, uh, where's the Himalayan balsam, um, what's the land use, so things like that which is a nice kind of general survey which just kind of builds up a picture of the river and the becks um, and river health, uh, that one's not meant to be in there, we've already done that one and um, that one, so I'll skip them last two. Um, so we, we, we understanding, we're starting to understand our, our river and our becks a bit more. We need to get up into the rural areas, which we've started doing, and we've started surveying up there, you know, where are the potential habitats for water voles, where the invasive species are, trying to find out what the, the habitat is like. Um, then we need to look at our pressures and impacts, um, which is really important. So, you know, what are the pressures on the becks? So the sediment coming down from, from farming upstream, bins, which is invasive non-native species, which obviously have a big impact, um, the management of green spaces, dredging, which happens by the internal drainage board upstream, and, uh, and flooding as well. And then what, what do those pressures do? Um, what are their impacts? So they lead to kind of oversiltation, as you'll find out if you ever got in the back, you just kind of sink in it. Um, lack of plant diversity from the kind of bit through the inns, loss of key species potentially, um, over under management of certain sites, loss of biodiversity, damage to habitats, things like that. And then only then we can kind of start looking at potential restoration options. Um, so let's skip this one. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll just look in a bit more detail. I'm not going to read through all of this. But we, a couple of years ago, we started looking at, you know, what it could be the potential for the restoration. Um, and this will change now we've got a lot more um, information. So things like Himalayan balsam that could be managed better, introducing new plant species on the banks, managing crack willow along the, the bank, coppicing, pollarding, uh, Wolf Avenue woodland, which is a really nice part of the old Tang Hall estate, lots of old mature trees but very little understory so it's it's only offering kind of limited wildlife value at the moment um Hewith home um again go and visit Hewith home really nice site um but you know we've been uh, developing kind of marshy areas there which are instantly getting populated by frogs and newts and, and all sorts of things um improving the kind of meadow management through scything um up at Hemplands, could do some planting. That's Baldwick Beck, planting. Lots of planting. Um, yeah, and, and as I kind of mentioned, kind of needing to look upstream as well. So as well as finding out more about upstream, what are the potential uh, restoration options up there, which could be as simple as a farmer or landowner putting a new fence up to stop um, cattle poaching um, on the water which kind of increases siltation and things like that. Um, it could be um, planting a buffer zone, it could be tree planting, lots of different things like that, which we've started to um, identify. And going back to the wider catchment, you know, it, it's fine to start on a little kind of Bex catchment, but we really need to be thinking catchment wide. Um, initially, Foss wide, you know, Fosses, the river Fosses are really kind of isolated and uh, quite contained 
catchment and river, there isn't lots of tributaries that run into it. Um, so the potential for those species that we've kind of talked about, the water voles, the crayfish, the potential for restoration, you know, it's, it's quite high if we can get something going because it is isolated and doesn't have that many external kind of impacts onto it. Um, but obviously we're always going to be impacted by the wider catchment as well and by the flooding. So there's lots of work going on at the moment in the kind of the higher reaches of the main catchment um, through the, the Dales to Dale Rivers Network, which we're part of. So it all needs to be kind of joined up, tied together and people working together as well. Um, which I didn't know this slide was coming, so that's good, good timing. Um, so yeah, getting the right people on board. So we're working with lots of people at the moment. Um, the Oxdales Rivers Trust, who um, who kind of chair the, the Rivers Network as well, the Dales to Ville River Network. Environment Agency, who we're working with more and more, whether it's on restoration projects or surveying or you know, lots of different things. Yorkshire Mammal Group with the water voles and mink management. City of York Council as landowners. Yorkshire Farming and Wildlife Partnership to get skills and to work with landowners upstream. River Foss Society is kind of the main um, community organisation kind of in the lower reaches and, and making sure we've got the local community involved as well. And we've had lots of good funders as well which have helped us and hopefully we'll have more of those. And um, yeah, to find out a bit more, you can check out lots of different websites, which have lots of information on. The um, Dales to Vale Rivers Network is a really good one. I'd recommend that. And there's a really good, um, the environment.data.gov.uk and magic maps are really good for kind of having a, a look at the catchment. And, you know, it's all open data now. So you can see a lot of what's going on, what surveys have been done, what the kind of plans are for the future. Um, so yes, I haven't mentioned too much about kind of restoration work because we, we really want to kind of focus on bringing in all the data first and trying to inform it and then working with those partners to try and kind of alleviate some of the pressures um, to negate some of the impacts. Um, I'm not sure timing, how we're doing, but um, yeah, that's it. So thank you. And if anybody's got any questions... How are we doing this? That's great, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, if uh, I'm just if you want to stop sharing your screen and then uh, we can see if anybody's waving. I'd, is is that a wave, Annalise, to ask a question, or is it just a a, a clap? <laughs> um, Thanks. I think Denise, you got a question? Yes. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, you... there we are. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, it's really interesting hearing all about the FOSS catchment, particularly um, for me, because that obviously <laughs> impacts a lot on my ward in, in various ways. So I just, um, let me see, what questions did I have? Um, it's interesting you mentioned engaging with organisations and farmers upstream and you did mention the FOSS Internal Drainage Board in passing. I wonder how you've got on with them. That's perhaps partially a rhetorical question, but, you know, <laughs> it would be interesting. I was on it for a while okay. and, um, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> um, but really good to know you're engaging with them. Uh, you also mentioned that they do some dredging. And I just wondered, this comes up quite a lot to councillors. Is there ever, in your opinion, a reason, for a good reason for doing dredging? There seem to be lots of different opinions about this. Is, is there ever a good reason on that? And um, was there something else you just said at the end? can't remember now um maybe that was it um oh crack willow managing crack willow on the banks what why why does that need to happen is that happening around huntington road area okay yeah i'll start i'll do them in order so um internal drainage board yeah for many years we've struggled and other people have struggled to engage with them um, they're very set in their ways. Basically, the Internal Drainage Board um, has the, the, the power or they're the, the kind of, they need to manage the, the rivers, certain sections of the rivers where it's not main river. So it's basically outside of the city centre. Um, 
So their main role, they'll say a lot of things on their website, but their main role is to get uh, water off farmer's land as quick as possible. Um, and to do that, things have been straightened. They dredge to kind of speed up the flow, which is obviously against slowing down the flow, which is a you know natural flood management thing. Um, yeah, so they do a lot of spraying as well of, of kind of the, the habitat and the, the vegetation on the side. So we hadn't been doing very well, but we had a really good conversation with somebody while we were on the FOSS um, a couple of weeks ago, who was actually the, um, the foreman. And yeah, it was interesting because we didn't kind of say, oh, we're from St. Nick's and we want you to change your management or anything like that. But we, we just kind of had a nice chat and they were quite knowledgeable, which was good. They knew where the water bowls were and, and where they weren't. Um, and they actually said that they were, they were trying to manage a bit more sympathetically, which is good. And they are doing less dredging. So they're doing less dredging and more, <laughs> more spraying instead. So, I mean, it's one or the other, but it, it's better than dredging, definitely. Although we then walked down a bit further and they were dredging a long area. But they're, they're dredging on rotation, which is a bit better than doing it all every year. Um, so that was positive. So, yeah, it, it's a big bit of work. All of the kind of engagement work upstream, farmers, um, it, it's very complicated and it's not something we've got um, that much experience with. So I think it is working with the farming advisory partnership and people like that who have had success in the past. Um, and there's a project which I didn't mention, which is a FOSS sediment project, which um, the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust have been doing on the upper reaches of the FOSS. And they've started some conversations as well with the, the IDB about the IDB about kind of how they're managing really. But I think from a kind of catchment point of view, and we've discussed this kind of in the network meetings, it's, it's trying to get us as upskilled and knowledgeable as possible so we can have kind of good conversations with them and it's not just somebody going to them and moaning which I think it has been in the past um so we are my screen's gone black but I think you can still yeah it's working um so yeah so we are trying so that's that's getting a bit better um dredging um no I mean the river should manage itself um if, if it wasn't dredged, the river would form its own channels. The energy of the river would be how it naturally wants to be. And it would just sort itself out. But their job, as I said, is to get water off farmers' land. So that's why it's done. But there's definitely occasions where it's been done, such as up at Derwentthorpe, which is downstream of all the farms. So, you know, why is it being done there? Um, so there is, yeah debatable I suppose. Uh, crack willows, crack willows crack and um, fall over so they're fantastic trees and they provide great habitat um, and because they're a willow they're, they're really good at kind of growing back through any damage through coppicing and things like that so it's I think probably where management is happening it's it's trying to kind of Pro, be proactive and get there before it kind of falls over a cycle path or hits somebody on the head or something so it's you know you can be quite aggressive with your management to them and they'll have lots of nice regrowth but certainly on St Nick's um, down by Tang Hall Beck really nice wide area there where you know we're just letting them crack and fall over and it's creating really nice kind of habitat instead of all vertical trees you've got horizontal growth you've got regrowth you've got decaying stuff within the the trunk which you've got wasps nesting in or whatever else it might be so they're they're, they're really good for the rivers because they're you know they'll take the flood in but i think it's where perhaps they're in more public areas they they do need a bit of management but they will take that management as well very helpful because I have some residents ringing me up saying they want the paths cleared and other residents ringing me up at the same time saying, why is people cutting down the willows? Yeah. Because of all. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you for a really great presentation. Um, it was very informative. Thank you. Thank any you. further any further questions uh, to Jonathan? Can I? Can I ask how do I, I've, 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 sorry, Kay here, I've typed a comment. 
and I can't find how to post it. What do I need to do? Press enter. Press enter? Yeah. Yes, yes. Ah, thank you. You got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so good night and good luck to everybody. Bye. Night, Thank nice you, to Thanks, Kate. Great to see you join us. All the best. Bye. Bye. I, was, I have a short question. Just that, that stretch of uh, Beck along Wolf Avenue, is there any sort of um, local engagement you know, from that area? From Is there a residence group? Is it purely the council that manages it? It has a bit of an unloved feel to it but i do i know people around there do love it so i wondered if there was any sort of structure or any kind of organization uh to engage with there um yeah good question um not at the moment um we have spoke to a number of the residents and there's uh, a few residents who have may have extended their garden a little bit and uh <laughs> into uh, wolf avenue well they're they're kind of doing it in a nice way i suppose um, but yeah, the council stream it um, once a year, if that, if they get around to it. Um, and that's all it has, unless there's some tree work that needs needs to happen um, or some dangerous trees. So so we've, we've kind of started doing a little bit in there as we've been working at Heweth Home. So from the council's point of view, they're kind of happy for us to, to kind of get involved. From our point of view, and certainly from Tom's point of view, it's, it's trying not to kind of overstretch our kind of resources at the moment. So we, what we need is a nice little funding bit that we can kind of not just work on Heweth Home, which we have been, but kind of bringing all the BECs into a bit of more joined up management and then really try to kind of get it to take off as a community project, which has happened really successfully at Heweth Home, where we've got local people coming every week without our support, got them set up with the tools. So you know, if that Heweth Home group could maybe be a Tang Hall Beck group, and then maybe there's an Os Baldwick Beck group, um, that would definitely be the future to kind of make it more sustainable. Um, but I think at the moment, it's just a kind of funding resources thing, why we haven't kind of started that yet. And I think it would need somebody like us to start it, because I think from the council's point of view, it's just there and they do little with it unless there's a problem or unless the residents got together and kind of did it themselves, which obviously we would support. Okay, thank you for that. Any last call for any other questions, please? Otherwise we'll <clears throat> ask Tom to, to give us his uh, report. No, okay. Tom, the floor is yours. Super. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Jonathan, for for your presentation. It's always really good to, uh, um, you know, to kind of learn a little bit extra. I always learn a little bit extra whenever Jonathan does a, a presentation. So, uh, so it's really good. Um, so for my part, I'm going to be giving you a whistle stop tour, and I mean that in the very probably literal sense of a whistle stop tour of the last uh, the last financial year. Hopefully, everybody has um, had chance to have a, a peruse of the annual report. Um, it's full of lots of pictures, full of lots of kind of hints, tips, all sorts of things. We've we've really made an effort this year to make it more than just a list of boring figures, because at the end of the day, um, you know, a list of boring figures can only tell you so much about what's going on. So I do suggest that you have a gander at that if you haven't done so already. So fasten your seatbelt. I'm going to probably miss out quite a few things. So um, if there's something that you particularly wanted to hear about or know about, then just ask at the end, because as I said, I, I just don't have time to cram absolutely everything in. So where do we start? Let's start somewhere near the beginning. Ah, good. For those of you who don't know, because I don't expect everybody to memorise this, St Nix's vision is for York to be a city where people value wildlife, the environment and each other equally to sustain a rich and healthy life for all. And the last financial year has been a particularly good one in helping us take more steps towards making that vision a reality. Firstly, I love this picture. Firstly, through connecting with green spaces, not only 
have we now identified over a thousand species, as Trevor mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, and those species of flora and fauna on site. With, within this count, there is that brilliant, uh, the brilliant figure of the 94 new invertebrate species that we found present on the reserve um, that our, our, our you know, fantastic wild watchers, um, young and old, have been finding for us. And we continue to manage the site, continue to manage the site and develop those habitats to support all of these species. And that includes those 19 priority species on site that we've, uh, that we've been tracking as well. So things like water vole and um, otter being the cute furry ones, as Jonathan pointed out earlier. We've also been making quite a lot of improvements to the Osbald of Kintang Hall Becks on site. So Jonathan also made reference to the, you know, the potential daylighting project that's going to happen. The site does have a Tang Hall and Osbald at Becks on site. They're kind of either end of them. If you've been down there, perhaps you will, um, you'll be familiar with those. <clears throat> but we've also been uh, improving our habitats through planting over 250 understory trees and shrubs in our 14 acres of woodland that's, uh, that's on the site and developing 600 metres uh, of species rich hedgerow. But it's not just things on site um, that we've been doing for green spaces. Over the past year, we've extended our reach beyond the York Ring Road. Um, some funders seem to think that York constitutes within the city walls. Um, so we've uh, put this map together to kind of show a little bit more of that reach. We've been helping to improve the biodiversity value and connectivity of 19 of the sites um, across York and up and down uh, the rivers you can see on this map. And that's been uh, doing work such as woodland management training at Millfield Wood, walk over riparian mammal surveys and white claw crayfish surveying as we just saw the little video of uh, on the river foss, ecological surveys and Himalayan balsam control on Osbaldwick Beck, walkover surveys and landowner engagement upstream Osbaldwick Beck, as we just heard that's really important, grassland management and development of woodland cops at Millennium Fields, greening up Micklegate Ward and Scarcroft Community Orchard and of course helping out with managing Heweth Home. And if you look on this map, this is in the annual report as well. It's, it's, it's quite small, so you might need to hold it fairly close to your face. Um, but if you have a look on there, you'll see that, um, you know, obviously you hopefully recognise the, the ring road of York there and you'll be able to see all the way up, uh, you know, up the foss um, there and right up towards Easingwold is um, where number one is up at the top. I think that's Easingwold, if my geography of, uh, of the area is right. Um, so all these numbers um, relate to elements in the, um, in the annual report and you can see the different kind of coloured patches around there. Those are all places that we've been, that be, we've been working. So during the last financial year, we've really stepped up our game in terms of monitoring and surveying. And I think, you know, all the little kind of um, maps, drawings, etc., that Jonathan's just presented has, has really shown you the kind of, you know, the kind of thing that we do in the sort of detail that we're going into now. So along with our weekly Wild Watch sessions, <clears throat> we also held a 24-hour bio blitz on Heweth Home, and we managed to identify 243 types of wildlife on there. So that's that's pretty stonking, really, for a, you know a bit of a just a 24-hour period uh, to be looking at. We've also been improving our links with NIDEC, which is the North and East Yorkshire Ecological Data Centre. Um, Tixis? I can never quite work out how you pronounce their name. I think it's Tixis Ecology and uh, Stockholm Environment Institute through developing and testing our grassland quality survey pack for lowland urban, now we get this right, neutral grass, grassland. Uh, and that's due to be launched next year in 2021. We've had to um, postpone the launch of that a little because of, because of COVID, um, which hopefully you will all understand. So as well as improving habitat, we've also been working to get, connect people experiencing mental health to nature for improved well-being. So our ecotherapy programme has gained recognition as a quality support programme that's like no other. It's really unique. And even if you look at any other kind of ecotherapy provision across the whole of the UK, our ecotherapy provision, provision is actually pretty unique. Over the last year, we've seen a 25% increase in participant engagement 
uh, which has led to 3,000 hours of nature-based group activity being accessed and over 320 hours of one-to-one -one mentoring taking place. Now, in all these activities, uh, you know, the participants do get to have that kind of more informal uh, kind of mentoring as well and some peer support, but those 320 hours are just very specific uh, kind of sat down with, uh, you know, with our project leader and going through, uh, going through mentoring as well. So recognised as uh, one of the top three mental health service providers in the city, which is, that's not bad going for an environment charity, just like to point that out, that's not bad going. Uh, we've been working with Peppermill Court, which is an NHS inpatient psychiatric hospital, Foss Park Hospital, which is the, the kind of replacement for that, I guess, uh, St John's University Converge, and TUV, which is the Tees, Esk and Weir Valley NHS Foundation Trust's Discovery Hub, and also York Art Gallery, which was uh, quite a fun, um, a fun little extra this last year. And these links have created really great pathways into our ecotherapy. So getting more and more of that nature link. So people aren't just trying to improve their, uh, you know, improve their mental well-being in some kind of distant off clinical room somewhere. They're actually getting to connect to nature um, through these pathways. And not just, not just through that, but they've also helped us to provide more than just those kind of practical nature, practical conservation um, activities. We've also been able to do more creative things like nature inspired drawing and writing. Um, and you'll notice here that uh, the hand that is uh, that's drawing this picture is not holding a paintbrush. It's not holding a pencil. Um, it's actually holding a piece of uh, a piece of twig there and, and doing the doing the drawing through that. And I wanted to uh, I wanted to share um, a quote actually from one of our ecotherapy participants because uh, we pulled this out recently and I think it, it sums up our ecotherapy quite nicely. And they've said perhaps more than eco or even therapy, it's a sense of participation that seems so important. That sense of being part of something shared. I'm truly grateful for the support I receive from St Nick's staff, the blistering of my hands, the moving of my belly to laughter and the 101 other physical and perhaps even spiritual engagements that seem to typically happen as part of an ecotherapy session. This is active involvement in one's own health and well-being and perhaps the privilege as well of being able to contribute to others general good that's so characteristic of ecotherapy at St Nick's. And sometimes at the end of the day, nature without nurture is merely just rocks, trees and water. I thought that summed it up quite nicely. So, so complementing all our nature and wellbeing activities is our action on, on climate at work that we do. And part of this action is through our waste minimisation and recycling scheme. Uh, last year, using these wonderful zero emissions vehicles, so our, our um, tricycle uh, satellites, one of, we have two of them, but uh, one of our trikes, uh, and our zero emissions vehicles, um, one's, one is actually slightly bigger than the other, it's not a, an optical illusion. Uh, using, using these vehicles, the team have hand sorted almost 400 tonnes of recycling that's being collected from the city centre, so that's uh, just over 2,000 households, about 2,200 households and 150 businesses. And our recycling team has also spent, uh, has also sent over half a million plastic items to TerraCycle. Half a million plastic items. That figure is just absolutely mind blowing. And they've engaged with over 2,000 members of our Zero Waste York Facebook page, helping them and advising them in all their waste busting questions. And this, this half a million plastic items sent to TerraCycle, it's great that we do that, but one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to move people towards using less of those plastic items in the first place. Wrong way. <clears throat> there we go. So last year, the recycling team worked really hard to expand our events recycling as well. And this is a picture of them at, at York Pride after a, a long day of recycling and still got grins on their faces and looking a, bit, a little bit like a, a, some kind of a band, I think, on there. 
So working with York Pride, we help them to reduce their amount of waste and litter that's going to landfill. And they actually commented that it's the lowest amount of waste and, land, uh, land, uh, waste and litter that has ever gone to landfill. So the team's doing a fantastic job there. They used an entirely new approach to, to doing this. And actually, we managed to trial it with York Pride. It proved really popular. There were other people who were running events that saw the team out and about at Pride and approached them to get them to do their events as well. So last year, we did more events recycling than we've ever done before. So really, it's, it's no wonder that our team have been placed in the top three out of 300 nominations for Collection Crew of the Year. Yes, very proud of that. So action on climate, it's not just all about recycling waste, it's also about improving homes that we live in, making them efficient, making them cosy and economical. Like you may wish to hold a housewarming party, um, like uh, like I think this is I think this is Ivana's floor that she mentioned uh, at the very beginning of uh, of this evening as we were all congregating. So hold a housewarming party. We've um, we've also done our open eco homes events. So getting uh, teaching people all about how they can make improvements to their own homes and what kinds of things that they can be doing to make their homes more cosy and efficient uh, and more economical. So it's also about supporting school children and adults to make their voices heard and help them take action on climate. So this, this picture's a wee bit fuzzy, so I apologise about that, but um, the, the green uh, stick that's in the middle there, the flag, that's our St Nick's flag, uh, and this was, um, this was one of the climate strikes that we went along to support. So last year also saw us test out our new approach to our environmental education through Nature Adventurers. And we, we decided we we're going to take more of a forest schools style approach to education. Previously, it had been very, very structured around all the kind of um, uh, the, the kind of the schooling, schooling grades and schooling years, taking much more uh, a much less kind of structured approach around that kind of forest school stuff. And around 800 preschool and primary school children managed to immerse themselves in nature and learn lots of stuff. And I think uh, Freya, who's, uh, who's the leader here, I think is um, holding a worm out to some rather um, slightly disconcerted looking uh, young girls there. So hopefully they, um, they will become uh, at one with the worms at some point. But of course, none of our activity is ever possible without our fantastic volunteers. And I'm sure that they were trying to go for some kind of, um, you know, album cover looking, uh, looking thing this time. Either that or they're a little bit fed up of uh, digging in the compost heap, uh, which I think is what they're doing there. We've got We've had 240 volunteers dedicating a whopping 7,700 hours of their time uh, this last year. And they do everything from litter picking, turning the compost heaps, repairing paths, through to scything, species monitoring, as well as helping out at events and doing data input for us. They work all sorts of weathers and um, all sorts of lighting conditions, um, like the teams here, like from uh, from Good Gym, who um, who've come in and in one one session of Good Gym, they managed to come in in the dark, and build and stock an entire wood store for us. How fantastic is that? So they're, they're a great team that have come along, come along and help us. And we also have learners come through from Blueberry Academy that help us with all sorts of tasks. Um, you know, they get involved with the siding, litter picking, all that kind of stuff. So they, they come in and work through all sorts of weathers and, and stuff. Absolutely fantastic. So that is a, a really, really whistle-stop tour of over the last year. And I have missed out heaps to be able to squash that in, um, in just in the few minutes that I have. So as I said, please do have a look at the annual report. It's a really great document. So what's coming in the next few years for St Nick's? Well, at the end of the last financial year, as we all know, the coronavirus lockdown hit and we all played our part in helping to either mothball projects at St Nick's 
um, or to help moving them online. So some of our uh, some of our more um, volunteer uh, related projects, like doing monitoring on the Becks, we had to essentially kind of mothball them, stick them on the back burner because we just weren't simply able to go out and do that physical activity with the volunteers. Other things like the uh, like the ecotherapy, we managed to move that to do online provision. So we were still able to support those people with mental ill health um, through an online an online version. We spent the last six months of, of this financial year stabilising the charity to get us into the best possible position to be able to recover from this pandemic. And also into a really great position to be able to approach our, our new strategy, because our current strategy is current, coming to an end, to approach our new strategy, our 2020 to 25 strategy, with the energy and enthusiasm um, that it really deserves and not to be kind of wound down and, and uh, you know, ground down by COVID. We were actually due to, to start working on our strategy just at the point that COVID hit. Uh, it was really frustrating because we had a we had the meeting all all in, in the diary and we were we were juggling whether or not to do it. And in the end, we thought we, we just could not we, not with the restrictions. It wasn't it wasn't worth um, you know it wasn't worth kind of putting anybody in harm's way. The pandemic's also meant that we've had to take another look at our extension plans, so the building extension. So perhaps you remember uh, back at the end of 2018, we were started doing a fundraising campaign to start getting funds together to be able to um, to be able to do uh, an extension. Well, unfortunately, as I said, we've had to kind of put that slightly on the back burner, um, and that's partly because. Funders currently are just concentrating on COVID emergency response uh, and COVID recovery. So any kind of capital funding is getting even harder to get hold of. But we still have demand there for workshops. We still have demand for education sessions. We, we've, we've been getting, uh, you know, people have been contacting us, you know, through um, through easing of lockdown, requesting these sessions. So there's still there's still the call there. So we're not going to give up because there is even more reason now to design a space where people come and can connect to nature. As well as all our other urban green space regeneration projects, uh, we, we've also been, our, our urban becks work continues to spread up the River Foss and Osbaldic becks, as you just heard from, from Jonathan. And in the coming few years, hopefully, we'll have a lovely daylighted beck that runs all the way through the reserve. So I think you saw a picture on Jonathan's presentation, actually, of the of the culverts, the one that just looked like a big concrete tunnel. That's what the beck currently looks like running through the reserve. So hopefully we'll get that daylighted. And not only is that going to improve biodiversity on site, but it's also really going to help create that water flood, the, the flood water storage area that we need, because it's going to be pretty deep pretty wide um, and, and, and yeah, and, and hopefully will um, we'll mean that we don't have the kind of devastating impacts uh, that we had of the flooding in the last few years. So we're also continuing to take more action on climate and calling for a green recovery through expanding our waste minimization projects. There's things that will be coming up in the pipeline about that. I can't, uh, I'm not going to say just exactly what they are at the moment, but they are, they are plastic related. And also through our open eco homes uh, and helping to people understand how to become, um, how to become zero carbon, essentially. So you see on here, we just, we just put up a couple of dates. We've got some things, um, some things this month. So if you are interested, have a search, you'll find those on our website. And as always, as I said before, there is there is far more to you know for me to be able to kind of talk about than I can ever possibly manage to cover um, in such a short kind of presentation. I, I swear I'd need an hour to be able to go through just all the amazing things that that have happened in the last year um, and been able to give you a you know flavour of what's coming up. Well, hopefully I've done that a little flavour. Granted, um, we did cover a few bits about it earlier um, you know looking at things around our financial stability uh, looking at the the building and making sure that that is something that is fit for purpose going forwards and how we actually manage to secure some funds to enable us to make those changes expanding our work around uh, around urban green space regeneration expanding the work around sustainable lifestyles and helping people um, 
help helping people connect to nature. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all our volunteers and supporters who really make the work possible we do at St Nick's and literally have helped to save the charity this year. And I'd like to give a personal thanks as well to all the staff team at St Nick's. They, they do so much behind the scenes and they giving their passion and their effort to help make our, our vision become a reality. They, they really are a huge driving force um, of St Nick's and they, they're a an absolutely fantastic bunch. So I suggest that, I've mentioned a few times, I keep plugging it, but if you haven't already looked at the annual report, I really recommend that you do so because it's uh, it's a fantastic document. Um, you know, we, we really have pulled out all the stops this year to make it a really interesting read for you. Follow us on social media if you don't already do so. We're, we're there on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, LinkedIn. So if you follow us on any of those, any of those platforms, then you'll get all the latest updates. And you can always sign up to our newsletter as well. If you don't already do that, you can select which kind of part of St. Nick's you want to hear about, or if you want to hear about everything that we do. And so that'll really kind of keep you, keep you up to date with everything. But most of all, get out and about and connected with nature wherever you possibly can. No matter how small your adventure, even the tiniest little step out into nature and just noticing what's around you and what kind of an impact you can have, a positive impact you can have on nature. Um, it would be my, my top tip for this year. So that's my whistle stop tour. If anybody has any questions, I would be more than happy to, um, to answer them. Or if you have any areas that you want me to, to cover that I haven't covered because I've skipped my way through um, an awful lot of work, uh, then please fire away. I think for my part, Tom, um, you said it's a whistle stop tour. You, you, you will probably need an hour. Um, I'd say more like half a day. Um, I'd like to personally uh, record my thanks to the staff team, to the volunteers, to the trustees, and to you, Tom, because you, you, you really are the, the, the hub of the wheel in, in keeping so many plates spinning, uh, and particularly over the last uh, six or seven months during COVID, it's been a real challenging time, and uh, I've really uh, admired the, the determination and stamina that you've put into to keeping things going on a day-to-day -day basis. As to the annual report, I'd love to know if there is some form of award or competition for annual reports, which I think it is absolutely cracking. And I know we shouldn't be talking about hard copy these days for all the obvious reasons, but when you look at it on the screen, look at it as a soft document, I really don't think that fully does it justice. Um, that's almost a coffee table document that that would wow people. It's it's highly impressive and, and um, full marks and, and everything. To congratulations to Ivana in, in leading on on that piece. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, we we live in difficult times at the moment. We don't know where the ends will of this journey will be, but um, I'm I'm mightily proud to be part of St Nick's and um, and admire everything that we we continue to do. So for me, a huge thank you to everybody. I've just seen a, um, I showed a quick scroll up the chat and I, I saw something about, um, about the recycling payments. Has that been covered? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, Asia's made a fair point there. Can we get a, a coffee table print version sponsored? Well, Ivana, you print a copy and I'll pay for mine, most definitely. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that we could really um, consider. Green, green issues aside, I, I acknowledge. We've actually had an offer from someone to print it, uh, one of the former trustees, so I think we could do that. So how many copies, well, I guess, is the question. <laughs> we'll work that one out. Yeah, I've, I've only got one coffee table. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so if nobody... accounts, though. Sorry, Rich? Maybe they're full accounts. 
could be. Yes, we we, we 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 need the perhaps the uh, the consumer version rather than the the full AGM version. Right. Yes. Oh, you miss out all the wonderful numbers. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. Did anybody have any other questions or comments or things that they wanted to point out? I do realise that I I raced through that. Um, I felt like I was going a million miles an hour, and um, mm. so yeah, I think I've probably messed my hair up with that kind of speedy, speedy go through. So, um, really so yeah, hopefully I've hopefully I've managed to cover everything adequately. Um, I think the you know really with the in the coming year, or coming few years really, um, and I was as with many many other organisations, so much of it is going to be dependent on how how the pandemic and how coronavirus. Um, you know, kind of comes through government and what other kind of restrictions and things that they end up placing on us all, uh, you know, to work out, you know, how we how we react to that and how we kind of go about our business and do things. Because at the end of the day, just because um, just because there's one little virus bobbing around doesn't mean to say that the massive, massive multitude of other elements of nature stop <laughs> uh, just because there's a virus. So, you know, the, the grass keeps growing and the trees keep growing and becks keep flooding and you know homes keep keep getting too cold so you know there's there's still certainly a lot for us to be doing um and i can assure you 100 percent that i will be doing my my absolute utmost to ensure that the doors at st nick stay open and that we can keep doing all the fantastic work that uh, that i hope you agree that we have been doing yeah well um can I ask, are there any further questions from anybody? Um, it's mindful of the time. We, we, we've run well to time so far. It's just turned eight o'clock. Um, if there are no further, further questions, um, I'd just like to close by saying thank you all for, for, for coming together virtually uh, this evening. Let's uh, hope and pray that uh, this time next year we can, we can meet in person and uh, I think that, that will be a fantastic uh, fantastic evening.